Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to the final webinar of the South African Savings Institute July Savings Month webinar series. We'd like to welcome everyone who's logging on as we start this, um, this webinar. But before we get going, we've certainly saved the best for last. They said that out of all of God's creations, there's one creation he created way after everything else, and that was the woman. And today we are having a particular webinar which is focused and at the women's financial planning as well as women's insights and wisdom around money. And as we go forward to launch August, which is Women's Month here in South Africa, it is only appropriate that we end this particular month with a webinar which is dark targeting our women. Now, before we get started, some of you have never heard of the South African Savings Institute. So let me start by introducing myself. My name is Gerald Mwandiambira and I'm with the South African Savings Institute, which is an independent organization which is dedicated to developing an, a robust culture of saving amongst South Africans. 2021 also marks the 20th anniversary of SASI. And over the last 20 years, we have engaged actively in activities around raising awareness on the key concepts of money management and saving. So the fact that you know that July is Savings Month, this is one of our uh, gifts to South Africa or initiatives, which we started in 2008. Ultimately, we want to promote a stronger culture of saving in South Africa. Now, perhaps our biggest achievement over the years is our network of partners that have joined SASI in delivering the savings message. We'd like to thank our partner APSA for making it possible for us to share these messages with you. For without them, without their funding, our nonprofit organization would not exist. In 21, our focus has been driving awareness around knowledge and savings in African languages, because one of the biggest ways in which many South Africans have been disempowered or not have been limited in terms of knowledge around money is access to information in African languages. That's why our theme for 2021 is hashtag ways to save, saving in your language. Now your language may be a spoken language, but sometimes it's simply a language which you need to understand so that you can communicate and make better financial decisions. Now, just by participating today, you could win a thousand rand cash to boost your serve, to boost your savings, and we'll be announcing winners at the end of the webinar. So please stay tuned. Um, and ten thousand rand in total is up for grabs over the various webinars. And today we've got four particular powerful speakers who are going to share their insight around savings. I will introduce each speaker before they come on, but the general theme for today is discussing how the pandemic has affected us all, the importance of saving and how many of us have been made aware of the crystal clear needs to save. Those who had savings have depleted them. Some of those who, some of us who might have or have not savings have definitely learned the need of having money stashed away somewhere. Now, if you'd like to take stock of your financial life, take control and get back on track, tune in. You're most welcome to ask questions through as we continue this webinar. Simply click on the Q&A box and ask your question and one of the panelists will assist you with a reply either live or a written response. And also please participate in the chat. Let's make this vibrant. I know the one thing is that um, ladies often have more words to share than gentlemen in some instances. So before we start, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Her name is Esther Mukumbo, and she's a development finance uh, specialist. I don't know what that is, she'll tell us, but she represents Malkia Invest. She's very active on social media. And on social media, all of last week, she was showing us her dividends. So we've got a woman who's making an extra income clearly, and she's a financial literacy enthusiast who loves sharing her own personal financial journey in the hope that it will inspire us to start our own journeys to financial freedom. As a working professional who has her own financial challenges, Esther will share her experience on social media, which is focused on community sharing information around financial literacy. 
as a mum. S, as she's passionately known, is passionate about empowering women to take charge and manage the finances of their households, as well as navigating the impact of motherhood on finances. Esther, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. G. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon, everyone. I am so excited today because we get, I get to share a little bit of you know, what I've learned, some of my own experiences, and some of the challenges we as women are facing during COVID. I think statistics, which I'll share uh, soon enough, will show that you know, we've been impacted by, by COVID as women. Um, just to add on to what uh, Mr. G said early, um, I'm a mother of two. Uh, I'm a woman. I'm, a, I'm everything you can think of. I'm a sister. I'm a mother. I'm a wife. I'm so many things to so many people, like each and every one of you online, I'm sure is. Um, which I'm just passionate about, you know, sharing my journey and, you know, just sharing financial education and how we can better move with our finances, given everything that has happened. I'll just start sharing my, my screen and my presentation. Just bear with me for a few minutes. Great, so today I prepared a presentation which, which I'll take everyone through. You know, I, before we set the scene, I just would like to, to go back and say, you know, what, what do the statistics say about us as women? What, is, what does it look like? Um, you know, how do we make up the, the fabric of South Africa? And the statistics show us that women make up 51% of, of the South African population. And we were the hardest hit in terms of the impact of COVID-19. Over a million of us lost our jobs. Um, it, is, it is estimated that over 40% of households are headed up by women. And it's also can be noted that the average woman takes less than 30% uh, to their male uh, counterpart. Now, ladies, this is key because we need to actually drive our finances. If we're earning less than 30% compared to our male counterparts, it means we've got a lot of work um, to do just to try and catch up and try to bridge this gap that exists. In terms of the financial impact um, of COVID um, on, on general finances of, of, of the overall population, South African population, we know that people are in survival mode. Right now, everyone is just trying to you know, um, survive this financially, mentally, physically, everything. I think it's the last year or the last almost 18 months has shown us just how tough it can be and everyone is just trying to survive. And what COVID has shown us is that, you know, every rand is, is being stretched. Everyone is trying to, to stretch their rand in terms of their income, in terms of what they have, and try, in terms of trying to preserve the cash that they have. Um, and a lot of people are also trying to, um, you know, if you've been impacted or your salary has been, has been cut, a lot of people are looking to, towards extended families. So more people are actually having to support their extended families with their income. It's just not, no longer about one household, but it also trying to assist those other households, our extended families that have been impacted by COVID. And as, as um, you know, I, I did a, a quick poll on my Twitter page, and a lot of the stuff that came out was that a lot of people had, you know, either lost their income or their income had been reduced as a result of COVID. You know, companies were having to reduce some salaries. And this has really has had an impact on people and women specifically as finances. Now, I just wanna talk about, you know, everything has happened that has happened. Um, there's been this huge event that has taken place. How can we bounce back as women? What are the things that we can do to try and, uh, you know, bounce back from this huge impact, financial impact that has taken place, not only financially, but mentally, spiritually on so many levels? I think one of the things we need to do is reassess our budgets. It's going back to the basics. I think COVID has shown us that we need to go back to the basics of reassessing our budget. What do our budget? What does our budget look like? If your salary has been reduced, what you know? What stays on the budget? What gets cut? How can we shop a bit more? I know the the family stockpile uh, group on Facebook is here. How can we cut back on our budgets in terms of food? In terms of our spending, to you know take um, to ensure that we're able to financially be sustainable over the next few months and the next few years. 
it's also about talking to, the second thing is talking to financial institutions, if you're unable to meet your financial obligations. Now, a lot of the women I talk to and a lot of the women I interact with are so scared of approaching financial institutions. Ladies, this huge event has taken place. Our finances have been impacted. There's no shame in going back to your bank or financial service provider and having a discussion with a consultant saying, this is my financial situation. My salary has been impacted. If it's been reduced or you're not getting an income, what are the options available to me? And some of the things that you can proactively do is maybe restructuring a debt. Um, having that discussion to say, can we restructure the debt? Can we extend the term of the loan? Bearing in mind that an extension can have adverse impact on your, your finances in the long term in that you know you, you have extra interest added on to, to, to the term of the loan, but never be too scared to approach your, fin your financial service providers to, you know, to ask in terms of what are the options available? Because it's by talking and being proactive that you can, um, find a solution. Don't sit in your corner and wait until you know the debt has piled up or you're in arrears before you approach your financial service providers to find out what are the op opportunities available to you. And if you're not getting help with the consultant, please escalate it, you know, be proactive and make sure that you know you are in charge of, of, of the little that you have um, charge over. It's about coming up with a revised financial plan. I think, you know, um, people say, you know, we make plans, but, you know, God laughs at them all. Um, because, you know, finan a financial plan is the best laid, is the best case scenario. And what COVID has shown us is that, you know, the best laid plans sometimes, you know, get derailed. And that's fine. What needs to happen is how can we adjust our financial plans? What can we do now and maybe delay a few, a few, a few months if possible so that we get back on our feet if we're not back on our feet? You know, do we need to speak to, to our kids, you know, um, uh, schools? If we've been impacted financially, do we need to, you know, reduce our budget, our food budget as an example? What can we do to revise our plans so that it's reflective of what's happening in the current financial environment and economic environment? It's also about using support structures. Um, you know, all of us can have some form of support structures. I know personally, um, my, my, my siblings and I have a family stock fell. And, and essentially what that stock fell does is on a monthly basis, we contribute a certain amount. And whenever there is an emergency, we go to that family stock fell to say, you know, um, hey, I've hit this financial snag, which, which happened to one of us. And how can we assist in terms of, you know, using those funds to tide us over until, you know, um, this we've gotten through this financial snag that we've hit. It's about, you know, growing closer with the family structures, the family unit, and working together to ensure that whatever financial plan we have in place will see us through until this, you know, this financial challenge has, has, has passed through. The other, the other part is looking for opportunities to grow additional income stream. You know, there's only so much you can cut in terms of your finances um, before you need to look for additional income stream. So cutting the budget is, is one of the quick wins, which, which can help in the short term, but in the long term is looking at what additional income streams um, can one create or can one look for. One of the things I know for me personally that I've started looking at is the gig economy and growing my YouTube channel. I've got a YouTube channel that I'm working on and trying to grow, you know, the subscribers so that ultimately I can monetize this and hopefully start making an income. But it's a long-term thing. I know it's a long-term thing. It's not now, but it's something that I'm building towards the future, which will ultimately hopefully be able to give me an income. I know there are people that do financial surveys. You can um, look up online financial servers. You get paid to do um, servers online. And obviously it's all about, you know, being able to, to get an additional income besides the reduced salary salary that or the, um, the reduction in salary that you might have had. So I just want to share a bit of my own story in terms of my own bounce back story. Um, a few years ago, I, I bought an investment property like everyone else. I was excited. I had this investment property that, you know, I loved and it was basically a pension fund for, for my parents and for me as well. 
um, and I loved this pension fund, this uh, investment property until COVID hit. So I had a tenant in there who, who was, you know, renting out the place and I was getting rental income. And unfortunately, you know, the tenant had financial difficulty. He was retrenched and ultimately ended up moving after three months. And that tenant owed me three months worth of, of, of rental income. And, you know, the house stood empty. So from May 2019, the house was empty. During that time, I tried to, you know, renovate the property um, and, and made a decision, ultimately made a decision to try and sell the property. So I started renovating the property around August 2019. And, you know, August 2019, it took about four months to totally renovate, you know, a few things in the house, the bathroom, you know, the things that would attract a buyer to the property because I was ready to sell. Um, you know, Feb 2020, the renovation was done. And guess what? When I was about to list the property to put it on sale in uh, March 2020, I'd literally listed the property for one week. And then in March 2020, you know, we went into lockdown. So there was no way that viewers could come and, you know, property viewers could come out or interested buyers could come out to the property and view the property. Now, I was stuck with this property. And during this whole full year, I'm having to, you know, sort of look up to the bond. I'm having to pay the bond. Um, um, uh, and, and still continue servicing the bond despite not getting a rental income. The one thing that, that for me stood out during this whole process was that I needed to be frank and honest with the bank about my financial situation, about not having a tenant in the property and what were the options available to me. So it, it goes back to my point of not being shy to talk to the bank being early, being proactive and calling the bank and saying, this is the issue. I don't have a tenant. What are my options? Because, you know, this is a long lead time. Um, I've put the property on sale and obviously I'm not getting an income. I'll still continue to pay, you know, um, the, the, the bond, a portion of the bond, but the, you know, the, the maintenance cost or the, the fund that I had to carry on servicing the bond was running out. And I had to be proactive and call the bank. And you know, when I wasn't, um, when I didn't get through to the first consultant, I escalated the matter. So I was very proactive, and the bank was therefore willing to, you know, listen to me, and we could work out a plan. Um, and ultimately, I sold the property um, on auction. Um, that's also an avenue I, I personally decided. And you know, sometimes there's this misconception that selling a property on, on auction means you're in financial difficulty. It's one of the ways, the quickest ways I know of selling a property. And I sold the property within three months of, of, of signing with an auctioneer. So this really left a huge financial impact. And it was about, for me, rearranging the financial plan that I had and making sure I involved the bank, I involved all parties involved, and I made sure that, you know, everyone understood and was on board in terms of my plan and being able to, you know, tide myself over whilst selling the property. So I hope, you know, my own story encourages you, whoever you might be that might be going through something similar in terms of, you know, a reduced salary or reduced income and you're battling with something like this. Be proactive. Don't be shy. Go to your financial services provider. Talk to them and have those conversations because ultimately I also a client. They wouldn't want to lose you as a client. So, you know, work out a best solution that works for the both of you, for both parties. Now, um, according to the Financial you know, Consumer Protection Bureau in the, in the U.S., after, you know, you've gone through a financial challenge, there are four elements of financial wellness. And I thought, you know, it would be interesting to share with everyone what those four elements are. The first element, you know, after you've gone through a financial difficulty and you want to bounce back, is, you know, over time is having a financial goal and a financial plan. So working towards a goal and a plan and say, you know, I find myself in this difficulty. How long does this, will this financial difficulty last? And what are some of the things that I can, I can prepare so that, you know, I work towards getting out of it. And, and for me, one thing that has always worked is be realistic in your financial plan. You know, some, a major event has happened you're trying to get out of it, be kind to yourself um, and give yourself enough time to, to, to really bounce out of it um, and have a financial plan and a goal. Look at what you have currently. What are some of the things you can cut out? What are some of the things you need to start doing differently in order to come out of it? Um, the second part, you know, of financial elements of financial wellness, wellness is being in control. 
knowing exactly where every rand is going. Um, this is so important for me, and especially on my financial journey, is knowing where every rand is going. You know, if you have to do a spreadsheet, if you have to do um, write something in a book somewhere in terms of where your money is going and keeping tabs of how you're spending your money on a monthly basis. I like to keep receipts from shops, believe it or not. And I literally keep a journal of, you know, what I'm spending my money on. So when I reflect, uh, on a monthly basis, I can tell, you know, this is what I spent my money on because, you know, you, we usually do a budget at the beginning of the month, but really do we go back to say, okay, I did this budget, but what did I actually spend my money on? Where did my rands actually go? And, and being able to determine where every rand is going is, is part of, you know, elements that actually show that you're on your way towards financial wellness. It's, a ha it's about having some, some form of savings. Um, you know, over time, when you when times are good, you want to make sure you're putting something aside, even if it's a hundred rand, if it's a two hundred rand, three hundred, five hundred, whatever you're comfortable putting away, just put something. Because as we know, money compounds over time. Um, so you know that two hundred rand right now might be two thousand rand in the next ten months. That. 500 rand now might be, you know, in, in, in a few months will be 5,000 rand. And that's how you, you accumulate slowly those savings that you need. And, you know, the world has said, well, COVID has shown that, you know, or the financial world has said, you need at least three to six months of your living expenses to be, you know, to be able to manage a shock. Um, comfortably. So being putting money aside allows you to be in a better position to manage a financial shock that might happen. Or having an emergency fund allows you to be able to manage a financial shock when it happens. The fourth and final component is being able to invest something towards your future. I know, you know, as, um, as South Africans, there's a high level of debt but I, I, I really think that being able to put something, and as women, being able to put something away for, for your future self is something I'm so passionate about because no one ever talks about this. You know, there'll be things that will happen in the future that you'll need money for, your kids going to college, um, you needing to buy a big purchase, uh, maybe a car, a house, or a holiday, or whatever it might be, requires that you know you 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 save um, for a short period, less than twelve months. But above five years, you're really putting something away, so that you know when a financial shock happens, at least you've got some form of investments to take care of something that will happen in your future self. And that and that for me are the four elements that I think are really important for us to gauge ourselves, whether we are on the way to, you know, being financially well, you know, this thing of financial wellness, of being in charge of our finances. And, and that for me, ladies, is, is, is really important. Um, and that's literally what I had to share. Mr. G, um, I'm done. Okay, so what were, we, we've all been really, Taken in what a personal account and testimony in terms of um, the journey which you have walked in terms of your finances. Um, and, and as usual, you know, there's a few questions which are coming through. Um, you spoke about something and a few eyes popped and a few ears went up and you said, YouTube, how does one make money on YouTube? Kindly share some, shed some light. That's from Noxi Tabete, she wants to know how to make money on YouTube. Um, she's obviously heard about it, so please um, do share on that one. <coughs> and also, um, you know, Joan, Joan Kaiser is basically saying creditors are not understanding of the current situation of the pandemic and the economic journey. They just want their moolah. There's one in particular who calls her every day, even though they are aware of her situation. They're harassing her. Um, and she's saying that she's at her wit's end. So as much as yours had a happy ending with your financial institution understanding, Joan is saying she's not going through the same thing. Um, do you have any, any words of advice or guidance for her? And any of our panelists, even when you come on, um, Joan is in that situation, she's being harassed. They know she's struggling financially or she's got challenges and they still harass. Um, and then lastly, you know, um, since you are a mom, what is the best investment vehicle for children um, going to high school and um, planning for university? The child is only one. So 
Fatima Amot. She's got plenty of time. She's got 17 years to plan, but can you give her insight? What have you done for your children? So um, those three, those three, YouTube money, um, what to do with the children and when a financial institution um, starts to, to, to harass you. While you take down your notes, let's have the usual roll call. The chat is, is moving. I, I can't even keep track of all the comments going through the chat, but I'd like to just acknowledge some of our guests um, who've taken this afternoon to join us um, with our customary roll call. Um, Laureen Masusu, Eileen um, Serkison, um, Altea Moore, uh, Anushka, um, Beatrice Banda, Bernice Karazzi, uh, Boitumelo Mabokela, Boitumelo Pebane, uh, Bontle Chaoke, um, Busisi Ntlane, she's usual, um, who's a regular guest, um, Charlene, we see you. Um, we're going to try and talk to all of you, um, but do keep the chat going. And what, what, what's your words of advice, um, Esther, on those comments, those questions? Okay, so I'll deal with the YouTube aspect. So, you know, YouTube is, I'm also very new on, on, on YouTube as well. Um, so I've got about a thousand subscribers. So it's, it's, it depends on the watch hours that you have. So in terms of, you know, content, what are you passionate about? Um, what interests you? And for me, that's, you know, personal finance and financial literacy. So pick a topic that you're passionate about, you know, you can, you can share a lot on, and you can also interview a lot of, um, you know, professionals as well. So how I've gone about it is literally from my sharing on, on, on Twitter, people wanted to know more. So I then started a YouTube channel and um, for you to sort of get monetized, you need at least, I think it was 4,000 watch hours. So the more people that watch your content and the more hours that people spend watching your content, the more you know you have a better chance of, of being monetized. And as, as long as you have 4,000 watch hours, then you start being monetized. Um, that is, you know, that is my understanding. So that's where I'm aiming towards. I'm not there yet, you know, I'm, I'm still getting there. So I haven't been monetized yet, but the goal over time as I increase, you know, sharing my videos, that uh, opportunity to being monetized will really come into effect. Um, the second question I think was around financial institutions. Now, I used to work for financial institutions and I sort of, have the the sort of the know-how of what happens behind the scenes you know if you have if you're going to have a if you're going to approach them approach maybe going through a consultant in the branch if you have to i know during covid regulations so you know just practice safe covid uh, regulations follow those but try and go into a branch and speak to a consultant and if, you know, in terms of what you, what are the options available and what can you do and make sure you have that, you know, that um, whatever agreement you come to in writing and it's made and make sure it's on the system. And whenever you're called or harassed, refer them to that particular agreement, make sure you get it in writing. So you have it in writing and can go back and, and say, you know, I have this agreement in place. This is what I have um, so that, you know, you're not harassed anymore. And the other thing you can consider is, you know, extension, extension of the facility, but just look at your financial position because each financial position is different. So you'd want to make sure that if you're going to extend the term of the facility, be it you know, a loan or a home loan, you are aware of the financial implications of extending that and the interest that's, that's there. Okay, Mr. Um, are you saying something? Um, no, 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 I'm listening. I think that's the two questions. And then I think that's the third. Did we get a third one? Yes, the third one was around the kids. So yeah. I, I, I love to look at, you know, um, I'd advise to go and speak to, to a financial, a qualified financial um, advisor. But how I have done it is that I, I, I've, I've read up, I'm a DIY investor myself. So I've looked at, you know, what are the opportunities that are there and how much can I put on a monthly basis? So I've gone it DIY, having, you know, gotten consulting from a professional, um, I've gone and I've decided to go DIY. So do it, do your own investments. And I've opened up um, separate investment accounts for them that I buy um, exchange traded funds for them on a monthly basis um, that all, when they turn 18, 
there's those opportunities, you know, there's funds available for them to pursue whatever dreams they might want to pursue. So it will cover their education and it's in their names. So, you know, if anything happens to me, at least they have something in their own names that they, they have that goes for them that will, you know, will tie them until they're, they're 18. So I invest um, using investment products and I buy exchange traded funds knowing that it's long-term for them. I have two kids who are five and eight and I invest for them on a monthly basis. Thank you very much, Esther. Now, on to our, before we move on to our next speaker, I'd like to dwell on that fact which I shared before, which is, you know, when God created women, he, he, he created his best creation last because the animals were there, the man was there, the land was there, the sky was there, the light, dark, everything had done. And then he said, let me create a woman. And the power in creating a woman is that he created someone who's able to multiply what is given to her. So it's one of the things I shared in our throw forward that a woman has a womb. And in that womb, one cell is inserted by a man, whether he hangs around or or leaves is irrelevant. But from one cell, a child is born with billions of cells. And it's that spirit which a woman carries and that she's able to multiply. So when a woman has knowledge, she can multiply that. And you can see that on Esther's um, Exchange Traded Funds account, which she shares on social media. And you can share it. And as women who are in this forum, you all know, when you have a man who treats you well and gives you good gifts and good things, he's a happy man. But when he brings badness, um, you also know how to multiply that. So let's complete, let's use this session to multiply knowledge and empower each other. Our next speaker is Leilani Bezentut, Bezedenhut. Yes, got it. <laughs> and Leilani started her career in 1999 with a large life insurer. And she specialized in regulator or ombud complaints resolution. In 2010, she joined the Office of the Ombud of Financial Service Providers as a case manager investigating complaints and preparing matters in close consultation with the adjudication team. So she's, she's got no shortage of empathy. Um, in 2014, she joined the Financial Planning Institute, progressing to become head of certification and standards. And she was responsible for maintaining preeminent standards for financial advice and financial planning. She's currently CEO of the Financial Planning Institute, where she continues to ensure the FPI delivers on its vision, its mission, and its strategy. Now, I'm also a member of that institute, and I'll do a quick calculation for, um, the, for the lady who wants to know how much she can invest for her one-year-old who do. I'll do a quick calculation on her, on her behalf. But for now, um, Lelane, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Gerald. What a privilege to have this audience today and to speak to my fellow females. Um, just something very short about myself, you've introduced my career, but I'm a mom, I'm also a sister, I'm a wife. I've been married for 26 years and yes, I did have to grab the calculator quickly. Um, so yes, I've been married for 26 years and very happily married. Um, and I believe life for marriage is a triangle and I'm going to show you the triangle with the husband and the wife on the side and with top uh, with God on top and the closer you all move towards God the closer you and the wife um, actually and the husband move closer together and then just something very interesting I had to giggle uh, Gerald remember we were taken out of the rip of the man so we are joint and we need to remember that when it comes to financial planning and also maybe budgeting. So again, thank you very much for that opportunity. Um, like Gerald says, I've been in the industry for, for about 23 years and I started out with just matric. Um, I didn't, my parents didn't have funds to pay for me to go and study. Um, so I studied and worked at the same time and I really relied on the big insurers and also in CETA funding. Now in CETA is the Insurance Sector Education Training Authority that helped me to pay for my studies. So yes, I was a working mom and I studied all the way from a trick to becoming a certified financial planner that I am today. Um, and yes, so I thank everybody that's helped me and mentored me along the pathway. And I am gonna mention one of our speakers today, Prem Govender. She was the first person that actually introduced me around the concept of what a certified financial planner is many, many years ago, and I'm sure Prem, you can actually remember that day. Um, I was a, a lot younger, 
uh, a lot thinner as well, but let's not talk about that. Um, but let's kick off today, I only have about 20 minutes. So what does female financial fitness actually mean? Now, if you're a visual person like I am, it's not a lady running on a treadmill with money in her hands. That's not the female financial planning fitness we are talking about today. Let's hone in on the word fitness. Fitness is something where you form healthy habits. Think about yourself on your treadmill, on your exercise bike, and it's something that you do regularly or something that you know you should do uh, regularly. A treadmill is not for hanging washing, but for actually running on it and getting fit. But then also sometimes we have health issues and we go and see a specialist, a dietitian, who will help develop a very specific tailored plan around you, around your weight, around your uh, goals, where you want to be, um, but also in accordance with your medical history and also your own blood group, maybe, for instance. So with that, I then want to introduce the concept of female financial fitness. So what does financial fitness then mean? It's no different. It is following a plan. And Esther, you spoke around a financial plan, and I agree, you need to have a financial plan in place that is tailor-made for you. You cannot quickly borrow your husband's plan, financial plan, and have a look at, at what you should be doing. I mean, think of his gym plan. I mean, I will not be able to pick up 30 kgs, you know, those weights. Leave me with five, I'm happy. So you cannot borrow somebody else's financial plan. You need to make use of your own financial plan that is tailor-made for your needs in accordance with your financial needs, your goals, and your dreams. That is based on a holistic approach, focusing on financial management. Now, financial management is budgeting. This is where you understand your monthly cash flow. And in terms of what you have and what you don't have, in terms of your assets and your liabilities, and maybe what you're leaving for your children should you no longer be around. Then also asset planning or investment planning. Esther also touched on it. So this is around the investments either for um, a specific goal that you have. It could be your overseas trip, hopefully, once the global pandemic um, is something that, that is of the past. Um, it could be you're saving for your child's education 18 or 20 years from now, but also your own retirement. And there is a difference. I'm not going to go into too much details because Esther touched on it between savings and investment. Very short, savings is saving for your rainy day, which is your emergency fund. And investment is for very specific goals like I've just managed, uh, I've men mentioned. Then you look at risk planning. Risk planning is about having life cover in place. It's about taking out life cover and maybe seeding. Seeding is when you let the bank be the owner of a life cover policy for the years that you may be paying off your bond. So that if something happens, that life cover policy plays out to the bank where your bond is. So it's risk cover in terms of life cover should you, should you pass away. But then also dread disease. It covers you if you know there's some disease in your family um, or you just you want to have something in place if a dread disease unfortunately should happen. It's disability. It's about disability cover. And then if you do have your own business, there's also business insurance. Um, insurance that you have for a key person in your business where you maybe cannot go without that person or you may be on a partnership and you then take life cover out on each other because if something happens to the partner in the business, you need to be able to have some form of life cover that pays out. And in terms of a contract, that's very important so that you can buy that person's shares. Think of a situation where your business partner passes away and somehow the business partner's wife or husband then becomes your business partner but they have no idea about how to run a business or what your business is all about. Then tax planning, um, that is what um, your holistic financial planning planning also looks at. Is it your personal income tax, businesses, but also uh, should you unfortunately pass away, your estate capital gains tax and so forth. Retirement planning, very important. So there is retirement planning before you retire, at retirement and after retirement. And then also estate planning. Estate planning is extremely important, especially in today's time. It is really a mess should you die without a will. Um, it is, it's not kind to the people that you leave behind and trying to figure out what's happening, what was your debt, what is your assets, what's your liabilities, 
leave a will, leave a footprint if you're no longer here. Don't try to rule from the grave, um, but have a will in place. Um, if you don't have where um, to get hold of, of a will, contact your financial planner or a financial advisor, or you can go to your bank who can help you. So that's a little bit about the plan. Then it's also about good financial habits. Again, Esther touched on that, but good financial habits is don't spend more than you earn. Now, I know it sounds easy, but don't spend more than you earn. Have a budget in place. Know what your income is versus your expenses. Um, if you don't know where to start, a lot of the time, um, and there's no shame in admitting that you've never done a budget. Um, there's really no shame in admitting that because you don't want to face the music because you know I only earn X. I've got this amount that I need to pay. How am I going to sort it out? So you'll, you'll rather run away. Um, you'd rather go for a walk. Um, but you have to take yourself and say, sit. Now you go, but where do I find a budget? Where do I start? Now, the FBI do have a program, um, FBI My Money 123, that is available. So you're welcome to visit our website, which is www.letsplan.co.za. I'll repeat it www.letsplan.co.za and on there you will find templates for a budget how where do you start it's an excel format you can download it and you can start planning with your budget um, and then also you can find a planner on www.letsplan if you don't have a planner it's a very easy search engine if you live in nigel that's where i'm from you could put in your city's name, Nigel, and it will give you all the financial planners that are in good standing with the Financial Planning Institute. And you can contact them and ask them for help. Then also another healthy habit is to manage your debt. Be aware of what loan repayments you have, but also there's a difference between good debt and bad debt. Don't fall into the trap of bad debt. Now, bad debt is retail store cards. You know that Willie's account that game account, uh, those Fushini's accounts, all those retail accounts that you have. If you don't need it, don't fall into the trap because it's so easy to obtain credit these days, especially in the low interest environment that we are in. It's better to have healthy debt. Now, what is healthy debt? Healthy debt is something that you pay off that eventually becomes, it, it changes from a liability to an asset in your estate. Perfect example is a house. Once you've paid off your house, that is actually an asset within your estate. Regularly also check your credit score. It's very important to have a look at because a lot of times you may not know that there's something on your name. There is a lot of fraud going on. And in the pandemic and lockdown, remember the cyber attackers uh, are in lockdown too and they are bored. Um, make sure you protect your personal information and do check your credit score every now and then to understand what it's all about. Emergency fund. Emergency fund, let's talk about um, when you service your car. Is that really an emergency expense? No. It's something that you plan for. You know your car needs to go for a service every 10,000 kilometers. Now that your car is at home, well, maybe we're working from home. You don't need a used car. But if you, let's say, travel 10,000 kilometers every month, you know 10 months from now, my car is going to be, uh, it's going to need a service. It costs plus minus 5,000 rand. And you then work out how much you need to save extra for the 10 months to make sure that you're not caught off guard by by the servicing of your car then quickly when i looked at this i asked myself is there a difference between male and female finances that's quite a strange question is there a difference between male and female finances the answer is definitely yes so what am i talking about and i can actually see gerald lifting an eyebrow what is the difference well, the difference is that females by nature, we are a lot more conservative. So that reflects in our investment decisions. Um, we don't like taking unnecessary risks. I'm talking to the generic um, female year and, and not the, the, the female year and there that takes, you know, she'll jump out of a plane, she'll take all the risks in life. You do have um, the females that would invest all their money in venture capital, all that put all their money in global equities. I'm talking about the generic female year. By nature, we are really more conservative and it reflects in our investment decisions. A very quick story. There's a book written by Dr. James Dobson on how to raise boys. Very good book, how to raise boys. Um, I did have to buy it. I've got two boys. Um, and it highlights the difference between boys and girls from a very young age. 
H. Now this little boy was running and he was jumping over a very, very narrow little river. He ran and he fell and oh, there goes his nose. And his sister was looking at him like, that's interesting. Um, and he stood up, you know, dusted off. And he went back even further and he ran faster and he jumped over again. And there goes, you know, his knee. It's just blood where you look. And he frowns and he runs back even further and he tries to jump even further. His sister tries it. How many times do you think his sister tried it? Once. <laughs> she did it once and she looked and said, mm -mm, I'm not going to do that again. It's the conservative nature. And the sister said, I'll come back when I'm bigger, stronger, and fitter. So there's planning in the decisions that, that, that we make. Um, so females are not reckless. Um, and we, we do not like to take more risk than what's really necessary when it comes to investing. And that's why you need a professional person to help you understand maybe your own investing too, uh, too conservatively. We refer to it as aggressively conservative. You're too conservative in the sense that inflation is actually eating up your money. Um, and you need to look at a strategy, especially if you look at your goals and the timeline where you should be invested. Maybe you need a, a mix of, of, of bond equities um, and so forth. But again, speak to a qualified financial planner who can assist you understanding your goals and your risk profile. Then another one, why financial planning is different between males and females. We live longer. Uh, that is a fact. If you look at the mortality and morbidity rates, now those are the rates that we die at and the rates at which we get disabled and those are rates set by the actual society. So females do live longer. It means that we need to save and invest more um, for our money to actually last longer in our retirement years. So yes, we do live longer. And now with COVID, unfortunately, it has been confirmed that the mortality rates for men has actually reduced. Um, we do see that there is more males passing away from COVID at this point in time. So be aware of it. It is therefore very important to be in, in charge of your own fi finances, be empowered. Now, like I said, I've been married for 26 years and it's still a difficult conversation for me, but we still have it. Does it end in a fight sometimes? Every time, sorry. <laughs> I'm being very honest here, but it's not a bad fight because we found each other on a maturity level where we go like, time out, coffee, tea, come back, let's try again. And we keep on trying. Um, we found each other. So have those discussions. Um, don't leave all the finances to your spouse because when your spouse suddenly passes away, you're not going to know what's going on in the household budget or in the, in the spending, or even if, if there's a divorce on the horizon. Then the last one that I'll quickly um, cover on, on the differences is salaries. Because of our very calm, accepting nature, we don't go in and negotiate for a higher salary. We, we, we look at, okay, I think, I think I'm clever. I think I've got experience. Yes, I, th yeah, I think that's an okay salary. We are still, <clears throat> and I'm glad, Esther, our, our figures correlate. Um, females are still being paid on an average between 20 to 30 percent less than our male counterparts in the exact same uh, position that we maybe are. Again, don't be afraid to negotiate for a better salary, especially if you know where the salary scales are um, for where you maybe operate in. Then quickly, let's look at the various relationships when it comes to money. I promise that I'll touch on it. So it is unfortunately true today that a lot of females still stand back to the man in the house and let the man in the house handle all the finances, even if you are earning your own income or if you maybe earn more than your counterparts. And this is not about let's attack men today. It's not that. It's trying to understand and own your own finances and be more empowered. Um, you need to take charge of your own finances by ensuring that you perhaps do a, a budget together and understand the finances together. You don't want to end up in a situation, again, like I've said, where you don't go, know what's going on in, in your finances. Death and divorce, that's always an ugly one. Know what's going on. Then especially if you look at, let's talk about that word debt again. If you are married in community of property, you need to understand how are you married. And I'm not referring to are you happily married or very unhappy married. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to in terms of matrimonial regime. Are you married in community of property or maybe with an anti-natural contract with a crew or without a crew? Now, if you don't know what I'm referring to at the moment, 
quickly find out, are you married in community of property or is there an anti-natural contract? This is something that you would have, would have signed um, with a crew without a crew. The moment that you're married in community of property, any debt that you or your spouse enters into actually um, increases your joint estate and you are then liable for half of the debt. So please be very careful and understand how you are married and understand your finances because it has a massive impact. Now I'm going to touch on financial planning for females. It's very important to understand what financial planning is all about. Um, it's planning for your dreams and avoiding your nightmares. I'm going to repeat that again. It's important to understand what financial planning is all about. It's about planning for your dreams. And I want to add for your family's dreams and yours and avoiding your nightmares, like leaving your family without a will or not enough. As mentioned, female financial needs are very different to that of men because we live longer and we tend to invest a little bit more conservatively than our male counterparts. Um, so it's not a bad idea to take a little bit of risk when it comes to investments. But again, I'm not saying take all your money that's maybe in cash and bonds today and put it into global equities. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying understand your own risk profile as it relates to your goals and your needs and what you need for the future. Understand your risk tolerance and your risk appetite. How much can you handle? Can you go into a fast Ferrari with Michael Schumacher around Formula One track? Or would you rather be with Mr. Bean in a little mini, 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 mini? You need to understand the amount of risk you can take. Again, if you don't have a financial advice, I'm going to repeat, visit www.letsplan.co.za and click on find a planner. There's a framework um, that the financial planner or professional financial advisor works in and drawing up your financial plan. And I say a framework so that you can understand when you go into conversations with a financial planner, what's going to happen. First and foremost, you're going to meet each other, whether it's via Microsoft Teams or whether it's via whichever digital platform you use or face-to-face, -face, please wear your mask, keep your social distance, sanitize the hands. Um, but you need to establish that professional relationship. Um, you need to understand, is this person licensed? And Gerald actually did a podcast uh, a little while ago um, about financial advisors and watch out for the Dutch ones. Um, you know, and I, I, I liked your, your podcast. So it's very true. You have to look at whether the person is registered with the Financial Sector Conduct Authority and whether they are licensed to actually deliver financial advice and intermediary services. Um, then you establish a relationship, you understand what he or she can do, and he or she then understands whether it's a, you are a client so that they can actually work with. That's where you establish the relationship. Sometimes at the onset, you go like, mm -mm, this is not going to work. Or you go like, yes, this can work. I have my own CFP professional that I work with. I do not work with my own finances because you are biased when it comes to your own finances. And sometimes you need somebody to tell you no or yes. What will then happen if you then establish a relationship? The planner will then collect information from you. What information? And remember, your plan will only be as good as the information that you give. So be transparent um, because at the end of the day, you want a financial plan that works for you. So it's your, it's your income, your expenses, your liabilities, your assets, um, everything that's around. You know, Do you have a will in place? How you're married? That will come up. How many children do you have? Do you have a medical aid? all that information. The financial planner will then also ask you, what are your needs? What are your goals? What are your dreams? What disasters do you want to actually avoid in life? He or she will then analyze that information and will develop a plan for you in terms of the financial planning components that I touched on earlier, which is financial management, asset planning, um, risk planning, tax planning, uh, retirement planning, and estate planning. So that's your holistic plan. The plan will then be implemented and it must be monitored. It needs to be reviewed at least once a year, or obviously when something help, or when something happens in your life, like the birth of a child, the death of a loved one, or a change in your income. Now, I'm going to leave you with 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 something. I unfortunately had quite a big health scheme, uh, and I ended up in health care oh, and in high care. Um, I never thought that at this young age. It was in, in the beginning of June that I would actually end up in hospital wondering whether I'll see my family again. It was not COVID, but it was closely related where I ended up with 
um, blood clots on both my lungs and I inherited a health condition from my dad, which I didn't know. No wonder I couldn't breathe. My, my lungs wasn't like a... But it then made me realize that, you know what, death and taxes are the only true things in life. And the question is, are you ready? What are you leaving your family with? I'm going to show this to you, and I hope you can see it. This is my book of life. It doesn't, it could be any file. And in this file, my family knows where to find it. When you open it, all my personal information is there. My medical information, uh, my marriage, again, happily married. Yes, I am for the record, but I am married and natural without accrual. Then children, I have a 19-year-old and a 25-year-old. Um, you know, are, is there special needs? No, they, they're okay. Financial situation, what does it look like? All my policies, my assets, do I have a trust? No, but if I had, it would go in there. Estate planning, um, my will, um, my funeral policies. You know, people need to know whether you have a funeral cover in place or not. And passwords. Let's say, um, and, and and we do have people invested a bit in Bitcoin and there's very specific um, passwords linked to it. If, if that password dies with you, you know, it's in the blockchain, how are you going to get that money? And then any pending loans that you have, any outstanding loans, is there maybe any litigation? Are you being sued? People need to know these things. And your employment details and your business details, if you're lucky enough to own your business. And have a file like this ready um, so that your partner can know where to find it or your person that's going to work with your estate should you pass away. Or your financial planner, they should know where to find this. And very important, you should always have two original signed wills um, with you and make sure it's a valid will. Um, but with that, um, I wish I could talk to you the whole day, but I wish you well. And if there's any assistance that you need uh, from a financial planner, I'm unfortunately not a registered certified financial planner, although I am a CFP professional, but not licensed at the FECA. But we have over 4,000, almost 5,000 CFP professionals, of which Prem and Gerald both are CFP professionals, proud members of the FBI. Please remember to log on to www.letsplan.co.za. Gerald, I thank you. Thank you very much, Leilani. So wise words. That file is so important. Um, you know, when something happens to you and you end up in hospital or, P or your family needs to access documents, if no one knows where to find them, it's a, it's a challenge. So that's also, you know, something we need to take to heart. Have that plan, share it with your partner or your spouse, make sure that it's up to date and your passwords and all that information is there, your PIN number, you know, um, is, it's important. And in the interest of time, I advise everyone who's logged on to look through the questions. They are being answered. So don't feel um, there's nothing going on there. All the panelists are giving their opinion on the various questions that are coming through. Read through those questions and read through the chat. Um, and we'll go to the questions right at the end because in the interest of time, um, we are running slightly behind. So our next speaker is from our sponsor and our partners. ABSA Bank. Now, Sasi has had a proud partnership with ABSA for the last four or five years, and they've become like our family. Um, Pumla, Tami, you know, um, and everyone behind the scenes who, who make Savings Month happen. And we, we thank them for being there for us. And Nombuso Pali, it has over 18 years banking experience. She holds a BCom in economics honors and an MBA degree. She started out her career as a teller in a branch, became a branch manager where a passion of unleashing people's potential was ignited. She branched out from retail banking to business banking and recently wealth banking. She currently heads the APSA Wealth Banking region for Houting East and West. And Nombuso is a firm believer that people are better empowered when they're given the opportunity to make um, informed decisions. Now, it's, 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 it's important that we, we share the experiences of the ladies in the house today. And we really thank um, the fact that we have two self-made women um, who, who do illustrate that gender inequality exists, that they've had to work themselves up from the bottom right to the top, and we respect that and their insights. Um, Absa, not forgetting Nom Fundo, I can see your eyes are coming through the screen somehow, but Nom Fundo, we know you're there, and um, obviously our, our behind-the-scenes lady, Tamarin. Um, Nom Buso, 
What do you have to share? What, what, how important is a bank to, to a woman? Thank you, Mr. G. Uh, good afternoon to everyone online. I am very excited to be part of this conversation. I think um, for me, what I'd like to share uh, in terms of how banking or the banking institution can be a good partner to all of us is uh, really sharing around uh, the uh, family banking. I'm gonna share a presentation shortly. So if you just give me a moment. Okay, so before I actually start, I would just like to give everyone a background in terms of my family dyna dynamics, because we are gonna be touching in terms of the definition of what family is. And um, for me, I'm a mother of four. I'm a mother of four because uh, I have a blended family. We have a firstborn daughter, 20 years old, who is my husband's uh, first child. We also have an adopted son who's 16, who we uh, adopted from uh, the family. But we also have two biological children, a 12-year-old and a six-year-old within the family. So you can imagine that in terms of us thinking around what a family is, I firsthand can appreciate in terms of the different um, dynamics that we face. So in terms of what we are going to speak on from my side, uh, like I mentioned, which is a value proposition from banks and more specifically um, EPSA and in terms of how it can actually help you, but we'll also evolve uh, the conversation into looking at the, the benefits that come from the family banking uh, bundled offering, how does it actually start to translate into tools and skills of being uh, financially resilient as a family? And a lot of what Esther and Lani has mentioned actually uh, aligned quite nicely to what it is that I'm also about to talk to. And then I just want to segue into also just looking at how is it that we just rope in our kids to ensure that they also start having healthy uh, financial habits that start setting them up also for the future. So um, here you can see we are looking to define what a family is. And as uh, mentioned uh, from my personal scenario, you do recognize that it's basically two or more people who are either related by marriage or a blood relation or adoption, or they live together. So there really is a very broad uh, way of thinking about what family is, but we know that they are united by love and they care for each other. And it's a social construct where the, the behaviors and the lifestyles are all aligned because there's a shared ambition in terms of the them succeeding going forward. And this way of thinking is really how we like to underpin the conversation that we are about to, to have right now. Um, here, I'm just giving uh, basically everyone online an opportunity just to start thinking of the different family variations that as banks we do actually acknowledge. We know that in, in, in families you have a scenario where you've got the young graduates and the young professionals and that in itself uh, has different types of needs in terms of supporting um, the children because um, they sh either are um, above the age of 18 and therefore they're at different stages of their lives and therefore they need a different type of support. Also look at um, environments where there's a single parent and usually that is usually uh, below the age of uh, 18 and you start thinking in terms of how is it that when you partner up with the bank or you look for the banking offerings that it looks for the benefits that start to align to that family dynamic. Uh, there's also younger families, um, also looking at younger kids, but also have older families where we know uh, children are above the, the age of 18 and they, they're starting to study and work and, and how does that uh, really work together. And uh, something that's very uh, become a reality for all of us, our extended family is now also becoming very close. I've noted in the chats us acknowledging the fact that um, with the economy that we're in, with the dire situation that we're in, the extended family, we end up having to take care of them. And how is it that the family banking uh, can start to, to address some of those concerns that we have? So 
if I just look at from a family banking uh, benefits and how that starts to translate into tools and skills uh, around having a family financial resilience, I think both um, Esther and Lelani uh, have articulated it um, very nicely in terms of um, emphasizing the fact that when one actually plans um, you you actually have the, the the flexibility and control of knowing where your money goes and so when you start um, adopting these family banking propositions like the one that EPSA has, it gives you that uh, ability to do so because um, as a family, you do have oversight of basically all the transactions that are taking place within um, the, the, the family household. And both you and your partner are actually now uh, can direct where the money go. So it also has nice value as like, for example, you will have uh, spousal discounts and you end up having the other spouse only pay, for example, 50% of the fees. That in itself is a saving because you are stretching your rent. You're not paying as um, much fees as one would have if we are holding uh, different separate um, products and you're going for this bundled offering. But the other value adds is that you find that there are also things like um, data or food vouchers or gym vouchers which start to account for the entertainment part of the family because if you are paying one fee that um, is looking after the whole family you at least know that there is a voucher that also allows you to start taking care of the entertainment part of the family there's also things like a bank on me or redirect your fee again it optimizes the fees that get paid because uh, one spouse can ask the main account holder to be the one who looks after the the, the, the fees so one starts to see that in looking at what uh, gets offered in a family banking, it is in actual fact the tools and skills that one needs. I also noted that in terms of the chats that we have had, uh, Lalani also tempted the fact that it's actually more of a risk planning. You also have a benefits like um, retrenchment cover, a disability cover, and a funeral cover that gets built into these um, bundled offerings, which again, starts to make you really stretch your rent in terms of having benefits from just one um, offering that actually start to um, help you in different scenarios of, of your life. Um, the one other point that I just want to emphasize is that this word around budgeting really also is very much enabled when one uh, starts using the, the family banking uh, benefits that the, 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 the banks um, um, help out with. And because with family banking, you can open up um, your uh, accounts for your children, it's easier to then start um, modeling and teaching your children how to spend uh, money in, in, in a good way and save money in a good way because you have a level of control over that. So in this next slide, uh, we are basically seeing the different um, family banking propositions specific to the EPSA bank. You will note that if you go onto our website or you uh, call any of our call centers and I'll share the detail at the end of the presentation, you or you walk into any nearest branch and ensure that you observe um, COVID protocol, they are more than happy to take you through a much more detailed way in terms of how these different value propositions of family banking can start to fit specifically into your life and start to help you to, to plan and exercise that level of, of control and um, ability to push your money where you want for it to work for you best. I would also just like to um, pick up on some of the conversations and actually the comments that have been coming through in terms of when one thinks of financial institutions, how does one start to maximize the type of relationship that you have? You'll note that some of the things that I'm touching on have actually already been touched on either by Esther or Lelani. There's a very, very um, good financial history and record that one starts to build when you ensure that you uh, actually are giving full 
honest and clear uh, background information whenever you're dealing with a financial institution because then they start to have the ability to um, tailor make whatever advice or solutions that they're going to be giving to you to be specific to the scenario that you have. Having worked in the bank many years, I have experienced clients walking in where a neighbor or family member would have shared that they're enjoying a particular product and come in and insist on basically that product and not necessarily always allowing the conversation to evolve with the banker that or the consultant that they dealing with in terms of ensuring that it is the best solution for your financial um, situation. And it is for that reason that I really would recommend that all of us, we, we should give ourselves the time to actually ensure that we, if allow the conversation with the consultant to evolve, to be authentic, to be honest, so that the appropriate solutions can be given to you. And that's one way of maximizing a relationship with a, a financial institution. The other thing is that it's also very important that we never shy away in terms of asking any questions where you are unclear. The more you ask questions, the more you are better informed in terms of really deciding whether something is suitable for you, for yourself, for your family, and whether it will actually align to the financial goals that you have. So we really encourage that in whatever interactions that you have with financial institutions that you exercise that type of um, behavior and practice. Um, another important thing is that we note that as customers, uh, when you walk into financial institutions, you get given rims and rims of paper with small writing terms and conditions, it's very important that you pause whatever consultant or banker or planner that you're busy with and insist that they take you through the terms and conditions because it is those terms and conditions that start to have implications on you when you need the bank to come and live up to the promise. You do not want to miss detail that um, when you think you've got some level of protection or some level of, of cover from a bank, then you end up uh, realizing that there are certain uh, elements that you would have missed. The next point is around, I've mentioned uh, that for me, the most important thing is you make informed decision. So it's always a good idea to take the time to listen, consider, apply your mind in terms of what it is that uh, the financial institution is telling you, how does it apply to your situation? And always remember that at the end of the day, it's ultimately your responsibility, your accountability, and it's your decision and you need to be comfortable with that. And never really make a decision in a, in a rushed manner because um, it does have long-standing uh, effects. The other important thing in terms of really maximizing relationships with any financial institutions is that we know uh, in banking that most uh, people, uh, it's either you're going to use a bank that's close to home or that's close to your work. Rather, always adopt a practice of ensuring that you build a relationship with one particular consultant because that allows them to really start creating that financial history and start giving you advice that aligns to the back and the history that both of you would have the experience. And it also allows you to have that humanized touch with, with the bank because a lot of times when we deal with money, it touches emotions and you want to have a level of, of connection with the, the institution that you're dealing with and uh, trying to foster that type of relationship really truly helps. And even though you walk into a branch and uh, you, you, you deal with one or two people, that actually helps in the long run. The other important thing is that um, when this history is built and um, the, the, the banker or the consultant now has an opportunity to put forward an application for you, for them, there's that heightened level of ownership of really fighting hard for, for you in terms of interest rates and fewer fees and added uh, convenience because that, that connection has been built. So truly encourage that level of um, involvement and, and relationship to be built. Um, the other thing I would just like to focus on is in terms of how do we build good saving and spending habits with our children. I think a lot of us as mothers, we think that uh, starting with our kids young is actually not necessarily a good idea, but research has actually shown and proven uh, that to be different. We need to start having 
good, honest um, conversations with our children in terms of what is money, how does money get spent. We need to be honest about our kids because most of the time as parents or as families, as you push the trolley through the different uh, supermarkets, your child wants this and that, that's the opportune time to start explaining what money means. And in instilling those good disciplines, we are actually teaching our kids how to um, delay uh, gratification and start building that level of security and independence from, from their side because one can always open up a conversation with your child in terms of um, if you say you want this toy and you have helped mommy out in, in the house, mommy is going to give you um, uh, your allowance and if you actually save for, for your chores long enough, I will match and then you actually have that ability. And um, a lot of um, experiences in, in life actually do show that people who have earned money do value it uh, differently than um, people who just receive money. So it's that whole role modeling that comes from us as parents in terms of how we actually teach our, our children to, to value the, the money and uh, start to really aspire for financial goals and actually work towards saving and, and working for, for every rent that is spent. Um, the other thing that I'd just like to um, focus on is if I go back to the, the bundled uh, family banking offerings that we spoke of, because as the, 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 the family banking has uh, children's accounts, one does have the ability to start um, saving money into those accounts and then you can take your child out for an ice cream and have, give them a card to go and draw money out of the ATM so that they start realizing how exciting it is to be independent, to and purchasing the things that you want. You are actually role modeling the behavior of them knowing how to shop smartly and want to, to save for, for a later day. And that's a way of you instilling good financial habits within um, our children. For me, uh, that brings me to the end of the conversation that I would have liked to have with this audience. Uh, here, please note that you can always visit um, the um, EPSA website on www.epsa.co.za or you can call the contact center on 0860-100-372 or you can always email and there will always be uh, somebody who's ready to get back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nombu. So we're seeing a lot of comments coming through um, around people not having an idea this family banking even existed. Perhaps we need a family banking advert for TV because people don't know about it. And many people are saying it's, it's a very far, powerful value proposition. And last but not least, um, we've got uh, a lady who has been an inspiration to, to many and has been in the financial industry um, for quite a while. And she's the chairperson of the South African Savings Institute. Her name is Prem Gavanda, and she's a professional accountant in private practice. So she's also a CFP professional and she's Spanish passionate about encouraging people to learn about money, good money habits, embracing a culture of saving. She was one of the pioneers involved in what we now call financial education or financial literacy. And to this end, she chairs um, SASI and is also a trustee of the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, no, Financial Services Consumer Education Foundation, which is set up by the Financial Sector Conduct Authority. Now, both organizations are dedicated to promoting financial literacy and encouraging saving and debt management among South African consumers. Prem has previously served as a member of both the FS, FSCA, Long-Term Insurance and Phase Advisory Committee. And she's a former chair of the Financial Planning Institute as well and served um, three years as a director on the Financial Planning Standards Board which is the mother body of all financial planners in, planners in the world. So in a way, she's, she's, a, she's well accomplished. And the nice thing about Prem I can share is I've worked with her and she's also very humble and, and very, very, very motherly in terms of um, how she, she, she communicates and how she's helped many people in our industry. 
Prem, last but not least, um, the floor is yours. Please hang around. Um, after Prem, we'll do all the questions. There's prizes. I know some people are leaving the office, but those of you who are still at home, um, we will be out after Prem. But um, let's let's get value out of this. Let's really um, squeeze every ounce of knowledge you can get. The chat is very active and the questions are being answered. Follow those links and read the questions. Prem, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gerald. Thank you for that very kind introduction. So ladies, your husband has just lost his job and there is a very good chance that you may too. Sadly, we know that some of these jobs are not coming back. Wow, that's rough. But the one thing that has consistently amazed me is the resilience of a woman. Women in general and South African women in particular. We know how to make a plan when the chips are down. We know exactly how to stretch that ram until it cannot be stretched anymore. And we know that we know what we need to do when we don't have jobs anymore. We look within ourselves and dig out that entrepreneurial spirit that lurks in all of us and we make a plan. Often that plan entails turning our hobbies into businesses that in turn sustains us and our families. So we are now thinking out of the box and are determined to start that business we have always dreamed of doing. The only thing that held us back was the security of our jobs. And now that we don't have that, we are free to soar. Yes, we may be excellent at making our dreams come true, but remember, there is a whole lot more to starting a business and it begins with compliance with all the legislation that govern, governs businesses in South Africa. So let me start by chatting about what kind of entity you want to use to launch your business. These are your choices, sole proprietor, partnership, private company or trusts. Each of these come with advantages and disadvantages, and I'm now going to go through these with you. Added to this, we will talk about the tax liability. Yes, I know that tax can be a dreaded word, but once you understand how this works, it's actually easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So here goes. Sole proprietor means exactly that. You are the business and the business is you. The business lives for as, long, for as long as you do and literally dies when you do. The business is not a taxpayer in its own right. You are taxed on any profit that this business makes. Even though this is not a corporate entity, it still needs to meet the obligation of all statutory requirements, like registering as an employer for PAYE, UIF and workman's compensation, if you want to employ people, and the need to register as a VAT vendor when your turnover and turnover of sales, not profit, reaches the 1 million rand mark. A partnership is exactly like a sole, sole proprietor, except that the business has more than one owner, and all owners or partners are the business, and the business is them equally or on a predetermined percentage each. In this instance, each partner is taxed on their share of the profits. And again, all statutory requirements as mentioned must be adhered to. A private company or a proprietary limited company is just that, privately owned by a single or multiple shareholders. A company is a legal entity in its own right with its own tax responsibilities and bank account, etc. In a company, there are two distinct parties, shareholders who own the company and directors who run the company. A shareholder does not have to be a director or vice versa. However, in a small company, company like the one you will start off with, will probably have you as both the only shareholder and director. So this is where it gets interesting. In a sole proprietorship or a partnership, 
There is no protection of your personal assets if the business goes south. But in a company, you have limited liability, limited to what the company owes. The only time you breach this is if you stand surety for the company's borrowings. Then in that case, your personal assets can be attached. The company is a taxpayer in its own right and is taxed on any profit it makes at 28% currently, but moving down to 27% in the next financial year. Even though you own the company, if you draw a salary from the company, it is obliged to deduct PAYE and UIF, just as any other company that employs you. Once the company pays its tax, any profit left over is yours as the shareholder. However, you can only take it out in the form of dividends after paying the dividends withholding tax of 20%. It is then tax-free in your hands. Ladies, please remember that all companies are required to adhere strictly to the requirements of the Companies Act and don't ever take your responsibilities as a director lightly. It is a criminal offense when you breach these responsibilities. I repeat, it is a criminal offense when you breach these responsibilities. I would therefore urge you to familiarize yourselves with all sections of the Companies Act, particularly the sections governing directors' responsibilities. Finally, you can trade as an inter vivos trust. However, tread carefully here as this is a really complicated vehicle to use. Not the least of which is its onerous tax rate of 45%. In some cases, this may be your only option. However, please get professional advice when you want to go this route. Nalani mentioned the Matrimonial Property Act and the various marital regimes open to you. Remember that how you are married has a direct bearing on your business. If, as is commonly done, and you are married in community of property, your spouse automatically owns an undivided half share in your business. Yes, he does. But then again, he is also responsible for half the debt that the business has. The same goes for an antinatural contract with accrual. Remember, anything accrued during the marriage, including your business, is accounted for when calculating the accrual, and this is split down the middle between the two of you. Unless, of course, you specifically exclude this from the accrual in your contract. But remember, this has to be done before you get married. If you are not yet married or contemplating marriage, remember to seek professional advice when deciding on which route to go, especially if you plan on going into business for yourself. It can be very costly to change this later. Like everything else, an antinatural con contract can be detrimental to you in the event of a divorce or even death if your husband excludes you from his will. The reason I say this is that oftentimes women take a break from their careers to raise a family, and with this comes a break in salary, while men continue to earn and accumulate more assets in their name. It is therefore in your interest to ensure that some of these assets are bought in your name too. Ladies, my final word on this is that whatever route you decide to go, I implore you to please seek proper professional advice. I know that advice such as this is not cheap, especially when you are just starting up and every cent counts. But remember that these mistakes can end up costing you far more later. If you, are, if you absolutely cannot afford professional help, remember that the hallmark of all professions is pro bono work, meaning that professionals like accountants and lawyers are bound by the code of conduct of their professional bodies to do a certain amount of pro bono or free work to assist communities and society at large. Feel free to approach such professionals to assist you. I don't know of anyone that will say no. You can probably end up becoming their best paying client if you continue to use their services as your business grows. 
I want to briefly touch on the subject of continuously upskilling yourself in your chosen area of business. Remember to take the time to sharpen your skills at every opportunity. You may think you don't have time for this, but remember that a woodcutter has to take time from chopping wood to sharpen his ax so that he can continue to produce enough chopped wood. Look at sharpening your skills in the same way and you will not go wrong. Even attending a webinar such as this means that you are giving yourself the edge. Remember that you are never too old to learn. I know I am not. Finally, ladies, I want to address the question of integrity and reciprocity. Firstly, we all know that integrity is doing the right thing when no one is looking. I would urge you to please conduct your fledgling business with the utmost integr integrity and ethically. As hard as it is to do sometimes, especially when cutting corners will bring you more profits, it does come with its own rewards. The greatest of which in my mind is the ability to sleep well at night, knowing that you did the right thing. And secondly, let me remind you of the famous words of Sir Isaac Newton who said, if I have seen more, it's because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. Ladies, nobody achieves success totally on their own. They do so because they had the privilege of standing on the shoulders of others. What I am asking you to do is always acknowledge these giants in your life, but more importantly, run your business in such a way that those that come after you see you as that giant on whose shoulders they have stood. Be a giant for other people to stand on. And remember that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I repeat, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Be that businesswoman who is comfortable to share her knowledge knowing that she is making a difference in the lives of others. Remember that knowledge shared is not knowledge halved. Knowledge halved, it is knowledge doubled. I think um, uh, Gerald made reference to that earlier as, sorry, as well. Ladies, may I wish you every success in your endeavors. On, and as you start on this path of your business, and writing your own money story. Remember some of the advice that you've learned over the years. Remember that very few people become wealthy working for other people. When you work for yourself, you have the ability to write your own paycheck that is only limited by you and no one else. As I take my leave of you, I want to draw your attention to the analogy where as an employee, you are in a very sheltered space, pretty much like a pearl in an oyster. The pearl is only set free when the oyster is opened up. When you are running your own business, you are pretty much an eagle with no shelter and left to fend for yourself, but with the ability to spread your wings wide and soar as high as you choose to, with the sky literally your limit. So for whatever reason you want to start your own business, think about and reflect on this comparison. Ladies, I would be failing in my duty if I don't add my sincere thanks once again to APSA for their generosity over the past four years. To Tommy Kelly and his team, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you guys. And I sincerely hope that our paths will cross again. Thank you, Gerald, back to you. Awesome, thank you very much, Prem. And I think, you know, we've got so much to learn from Prem because she's been running a business forever <laughs> and she's traveled the world. And guess what? She's a grandmother, she's a mother, she's a wife, and she, she's balancing all those balls. So the official part of our webinar is over, but because it's the last webinar and because we're dealing with, you know, God's most pre precious creations, women, I'm going to open the mics. Um, if you have something to say, a question you would like to ask, simply um, put up your hand and um, Tamron will pick you up or we'll see you. And let's have a discussion. There are so many questions which have come through. 
Um, Prem, one of the questions maybe you can address is, as a business person, how much do I pay myself? Um, how much do I pay myself? And unfortunately, you know, the elephant in the room, you know, is men. What happens and how can a woman protect herself when the D word approaches? And I think, you know, we, 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 we always mean well, but the reality is, you know, um, we're almost having a situation where, as Leilani started, she was talking about the triangle with God on top, a husband on the right, a wife on the left. Um, we're almost living a life where people are moving towards the bottom and getting further and further away. So have you encountered a situation where you've had to assist a woman who's had to deal with divorce um, and especially maybe someone who had given up a career and also, you know, just words of, words of wisdom in terms of how much do you pay yourself? Do you pay yourself? What year did you start paying yourself or have you been paying yourself from day one? Thank you, Gerald. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, one of the pitfalls of running your business is definitely that you, you tend to pay yourself last. Um, you, you tend to pay yourself when there is sufficient money in the kitty. But I think that's just in the early years. As the years go by and you start to, to, to earn more or manage your business better, you can actually pay yourself first. Um, together with the rest of your staff members. Um, also remember that in as much as you, you want to pay yourself and build your own personal wealth, it's important to put back into your company. It's important to expand your company because the more you expand, obviously the more money you make. On the question of you know, divorce and, and um, what happens when um, you know, a woman feels that she's hard done by in a divorce. You know, the only, the, the only um, uh, advice I can give to women is that please know who you are marrying. You need to have the money conversation. You know, it's, it's common knowledge that's the, that the only time a couple fights is when they are talking about money. So if you don't have the money conversation right at the outset, then you are destined for trouble. And I'm going to repeat something that I often say. It amazes me that women will spend hours with a, a wedding planner for an event that's once off, probably only lasts an hour. And yet they will not think to engage the services of a financial planner for a lifelong event, which is marriage. Definitely, and I think that is so important. Financial planning, should be part of the fire marriage counseling process. And, you know, you know, ladies and gentlemen will spend weeks and months planning the wedding, the big day, but not planning the years that lie ahead. Um, Lerato, um, you can unmute, um, Mpo, Mpo, you can unmute yourself. Please, uh, if you want to share, do ask your question. And then after Mpo Mdima, we're going to have Lerato, um, who's also raised their hand, she's got a question. So after Mpo, you can, you can take your mic. Um, please share. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gerald. Can you guys hear me? We hear you loud and clear. Okay. Thank you so much, Gerald. This is this has been such an awesome and um, experience. Uh, I also started a company last year during the pandemic. My question is regarding funding. During this time, a lot of um, savings were depleted and eroded. How open are banks um, with funding startup companies? And um, in terms of interest rates as well, how negotiable are those interest rates? Thank you so much. Okay, well, hopefully more numbers will get help. And Lerato, please take your mic as well. Um, so that we can handle both questions one after the other. If you have your question, do put your hand up and we'll see you. Um, Lerato Tabeneng, um, please unmute yourself. We see you, but you're muted. Okay, Lerato is not- Hello. So okay, yes, we hear you. Hi, hi, Mr. G. Um, I, I have... Uh... I'm so inspired to be here today. Uh, I've been attending some of this, some of this um, webinars. 
but I am kind of, I don't know who can answer this or who can, who can give me, um, what's this, uh, a light on this one because I am starting, I'm starting on my, my company and it is kind of um, hard to, to, to actually um, keep the, the savings for the profit for the company, for my small company and my, my salary because yes I, I do need my own salary but well again I want to know how much do I save for my um how much do I pay myself basically as okay. a small company like literally a small small company I am a, a graphic designer but I do various consulting consulting in graphic creatives Okay, so we'll take on those two questions. I think Nombuso, um, the question from Paul was funding for a small business. Um, do banks look at them and how can it work? An alternative funding mechanism, which we did speak of was stock fails or community or crowdfunding um, or family members. A lot of the big people who we worship today as billionaires um, were funded by family and friends. And I'd also like to throw a curveball at Esther because Esther, you are holding a lot of investment um, webinars and forums. Why aren't you guys looking at private equity in terms of funding little businesses, which you can, you can grow with? Um, and so Esther, that one is for you. But Nombuso, um, banking and financing small business, um, are you assisting, especially in light of so many people um, being forced to become sole proprietors or starting businesses now? Uh, thank you, Mr. G, and thank you for the question from uh, Mpo. So, yes, banks do actually uh, help out uh, startup businesses. And again, uh, the best way to actually uh, be assisted is actually reach out to your nearest branch. So, uh, because we are a bank, the first um, way we try and assist is basically see whether the candidate actually qualifies for us to extend credit to them. But if they do not, we do actually partner up with um, other partners who actually help out in terms of education or actually partner up with different institutions that actually uh, take a portion of the collateral to actually make the candidates actually qualify. So what I would appreciate is actually if I can get to impose um, details so that I can share better information that's more suited to her situation. And I think that will help her in a much better way. Cool. Great. Mpo, get in touch with Nombuso and she might be able to assist you. Um, real help, real solutions. Um, I think we had a mentorship query, query more around Lerato Tabe, Tabeneng, um, Prem. She's saying, how much should I pay myself? And, you know, I think she's saying she needs guidance and direction mentorship or something to to help steer her ship in terms of growing her business so so you know it's, it's unfortunate when you do start your business particularly if you know you're on, on the back end of having just lost your job you don't have any savings and whatever little capital you've got you've put it into this business in the hope that it will generate enough income for you it's unfortunate, but perhaps for the first couple of months, you might have to go without a salary. That's the reality of the situation. You're going to have to work very hard. But remember, don't begrudge this. Look at it as an investment in your future, an investment in yourself, and an investment in this ability to earn far more going forward. Yes, you're going to have to make some really serious decisions, cut out some really, um, you know, cut out any extravagance cut out expenses that you can probably do without. And I think more importantly, you, you have to get the buy-in from your family. Your family, your husband and your children need to know that ultimately it is for their good as well. So they need to assist you on this journey of starting up your business. Unfortunately, there's no quick fix. You're just going to have to take the hard, long road ahead. And also, Lerato, consider joining a business forum for mentorship and preferably finding other ladies who can maybe mentor you on your journey of uh, being an entrepreneur. We're going on to Paulina just now, but an interesting one on the chat. Um, this is coming from Samson Kane. She's basically saying the fights are there and there's a lot of disagreements, 
but it is very important to talk to your partner about finances. I have noted that my husband manages his money very badly. He does not respect the 100 rand, and I always remind him to give me the 100 rand so I can show him what to do with it. He is quite good with interest rates and the jargon, but budgeting is my responsibility, my baby. This webinar has made me realize that we need to meet each other halfway, and this could actually help us achieve a lot. The finance conversations are very important, and they need to be addressed as soon as possible. So that's a motivational um, message as well. Um, in terms of us knowing that we need to have those conversations. And in any marriage, there's a strong partner and there's a weaker partner. Uh, I'm a CFP professional, but I'm not the one who runs the finances of my home because I may have the theoretical knowledge, but in terms of practical knowledge, my wife is the better one um, when it comes to managing money. And it's important um, for Paulina. Remember that analogy which I started that you are as a woman, you have a womb. And that womb allows you to incubate and create an entire new being from just two, two cells, a zygote, going back to biology. You know, the zygote, it, it, it just um, metamorphosizes and it changes. Now I'm going right back to when I was 16, 17, learning about biology. And out of you comes a whole being, complete and independent. And it's the same thing, I would think, when you also start your business. There will be times when you have that morning sickness. You don't want to work. It's not working. The invoices are not coming in. The clients are not there. But you give it that nine-month period. And trust me and believe, after that nine months, you will see your miracle come through. And it's the same thing with the business. Um, you know, being in private practice and running your own business, it's painful sometimes. Sometimes you almost want to throw in the towel. But remember, it, it, it's not for everyone as well, um, this journey. Paulina... Um, your mic is open. Um, please do share. Um, please unmute yourself and you can have a question. We'll take three more questions and then we'll officially close um, the webinar and July Savings Month. So three more questions, three hands. Please raise them. One is up. Ler Lerone is there. Uh, Lerone Colby. Is there anyone else? I need two more hands and then we, we can close um, off our session. Um, Devashni Chetty. She's put up a hand, one more hand, one more hand. It's going once, going twice. One more hand, one more hand. We just need one more hand so that we can close the session. Fatima Ahmad and Lerato Moloko, we got two hands for the price of one. Now we've got, oh, okay, guys. <laughs> the hands are flowing. Can we cut it off? Okay, we've got to have these, these, these speakers and that's it. Tembi, Fatima, Devashni, Lerone, please hold on. And Polina, you've got the mic. And then... Um, we will take up the conversation uh, offline. Good afternoon, ladies and gents. Um, thank you so much for a stunning webinar. Very much needed. So I have found myself in a bit of a pickle. Um, about three years ago, I purchased a vehicle and I took a balloon. So now I'm sitting with this chunk that needs to be paid off at the end. How can I, what are my options? Can I renegotiate? I just need assistance with that. Thank you. Okay, let's have Lorodi and, and Fatima and Devashini. Um, I'll open the mic now for Le, Lerone. You can talk, um, you can unmute yourself. So I will take all the questions and then we can wrap up. Hi guys, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect, so I actually asked the question in the chat. Um, do you think it's a good time to save right now based on the low interest rate that the uh, financial institutions are offering or is it a better idea for me to pay that extra into my bond to get a compound in saving on my bond rather because the repo rate is so low and the bank has given uh, lower rates in terms of your home loan? That's where, that's my question. And well okay. done to my CEO, Lelani. Okay. And then um, I'll allow to talk Fatima. You uh, unmute yourself. Please talk. Hi. Um, I just want to find out if you're married in community of property, can you still purchase a property just on your own, individually on your own? Is that um, still allowed? Okay. And then we have Devashni Chetty. Are you still there or shall we... Take a pass. You have to raise your hand so I can see you um, if you still want to speak. But the financial planners, can you deal with the interest rate one? Okay, Devashni, your question. I've opened to unmute yourself. 
Um, I, I, I don't really have a, a question. I just want to do to, uh, comment on um, just what a wonderful webinar all of this is. This is my second year attending and such valuable advice. And I took the advice of last year to find a financial planner and it was such a journey. So I just wanted to say thank you um, because last year's webinars and this year's webinars just changed um, my perception of finances and what a journey it has been. So for all of um, the new listeners, um, this is a, a journey that is well worth taking. Taking. Thank, I mean. thank you for those comments, Devashni. And last but not least, Tato, you may unmute yourself. You're the last speaker before we go with the closing formalities. Thank you. Okay, so num number one, I'm waiting for my thousand rand I won from the 7th of July. Number two, um, so I'm planning on buying my first car, right? And I'm wondering whether or not um, to take a balloon payment. But hear me out, Ne. Yeah? If I take a balloon payment that's within, let's say 10, 15K, right? Can I pay it off um, sooner than when I'm done paying off my car? I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but I would like to pay it off before the five or six year term that I've signed up. Okay, Do so I have balloon... an option to pay off a balloon payment before the end of my term? Okay, so balloon payment questions, uh, financial planners in the house, um, Leilani or, or Prem, do you want to take it or should I take it? I, I'm, I, Gerald, I'm happy to take that and okay. I'm going to be, I'm going to be brutal about it. I'm yeah. sorry, but if you need to take a, if you need to structure your finance where you need to have a balloon payment, it simply means that you cannot afford that car. Mm. That is why you would do a balloon payment. So lower your expectations, lower your desires, and buy a car that you can actually afford that doesn't have a balloon payment. Okay. Oh, sorry, I know that's harsh, but it's the reality. And that's the reality. I think cars have become so expensive. And normally when I give advice, I would say, if you want to know how much you can afford in a car, take 10% of your income monthly. That should be the maximum car repayment you can afford. 10% at the very top. So you need to structure it that way. We're all driving in cars a lot of the time, which are behind, above our pay grade. And, and it's necessary that you take that reality check. Um, if you've got that balloon payment coming through, um, normally it's part of the contract and you can't actually get rid of it until you finish um, you finish your contract. But obviously, if you, if you pay your, your higher purchase installments more, you'll finish ahead of time and normally to balance out. But I, I, I won't answer that one because I'm not a vehicle finance specialist um, in terms of can you pay your balloon payment in advance. But what I do understand, it is part of the structure of the contract. Um, Laroni Kobe was asking, with the low interest rates, is it better or not that I pay my money into a bond? Uh, than, than, than the current prevailing low interest rates. Um, look, my answer to you is simply this. Generally, you'd say yes, but holistically, we need to look at your, to do your financial planning process in terms of understanding your goals and your requirements in terms of financial planning needs. So I would say, you know, um, go on to that letsplan.co.za. Um, you can look up any planners in your area gives you the experience. Some of them have pictures. Um, if you want to engage with myself, find me on Let's Plan and let's have that conversation and, and see if we can go further. And then I think, um, did we cover all the questions? I think we had two balloon payments. And okay. Devashni, thank you for your kind words. Um, to close off formally, thank you all for joining us um, with the South African Savings Institute for this year's National July Savings Month. We'd like to formally thank our sponsors, APSA, for walking this journey with us for the last four or five years. And hopefully um, we will secure a new sponsorship and proceed next year with bigger and better opportunities. Um, we did get a message coming through that we wish we could have monthly webinars so that we keep these conversations going. The only disappointment today is that there's so few men in the house, um, but the, the hope is not lost. They can log on to ways to save.co.za or Facebook or YouTube. This has been recorded. If you want to watch it again, please um, do that. 
the questions which are in our our chat box we've been answering along the way so hopefully we've addressed most of them i'd like to finally thank our panelists for today prem thank you for always being there and supporting us esther thank you for being that voice on social media which talks reason talks investments and my challenge to you esther is start looking at private equity opportunities. So you start looking for business plans, find us the next Apple, find us the next um, you know, Microsoft from South African um, small businesses because it's, uh, they need support and they need funding. Leilani, thank you for insp your inspirational journey. Um, it was, it's it's quite, uh, quite a journey. I think we crossed paths when we, when we were still also very young, <laughs> much thinner. <laughs> At, at, at one of the life insurers earlier on in our careers, but it's good to see Indeed. to see journeys which come to something to a good end. And obviously, Nombuso, glad, glad to have you here as well. You spoke about family banking. We've never heard about it. We're not doing enough. APSA, TAMI, um, Pumla, let's get this family banking out in the, in the open so people know how much they can benefit. You know, for me, it was just the entertainment vouchers which came to be like, Okay, that, that, that takes care of um, movie night or whatever we need to do with the children. And, and those things, you know, when it comes to saving, you want to save everywhere. Um, and we will continue conversations. Please catch us on social media. Tamron Brown, it's been a wild journey. Thank you for July Savings Month being in the back. And um, if you don't Daryl. play that, if you don't play the oh yeah, we've Daryl. got winners, 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 money, money. Yes, okay. winners. Tato, Tato, you said you want your money. Maybe you use it for your car deposit. We will be processing the winners today wow. and tomorrow. So you should get your thousand rand in the mail Yay! shortly. <laughs> so to winners for today. Okay, I'm trying to find them because the chat moves very fast. And I did see something on time. We've got four winners for today. Thank you for sticking around. Okay. okay, here we go. Zama, Zamantung, Zamantungwa Kumalo. You are a winner of a thousand South African Rand. Lindelo Mahonga, you are also a winner of a, a thousand South African Rand. Um, we've got ha Habile Zamakusi, you are also a winner of a thousand South African Rand. And last but not least, we've got Iman. Iman Ngwepe Nshibita. Sorry, I'm, I'm not good with pronunciations. Um, Iman, you're also a winner of a thousand rand. So our winners, congratulations. And your, your checks or your EFTs uh, will come through. We've got your registration details. So we will contact you via email to finalize this process. So. Before I start my song, can we have the outro? Thank you, everyone. Spread the word. Let's save together. And if you'd like to partner, volunteer, work with the South African Savings Institute, um, you're most welcome to, to, to contact us and approach us. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks for the question, Laron, and thank you for attending.